Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 345. 345, I love it. For Monday, May 9th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire, for a couple more hours. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. <sighs> How are we doing today, Mr. Kent? Good. My Good. my music life is, is taking wings right now. <laughs> I had three great gigs last weekend. I've got six gigs in five days coming up. So wow. It's, uh, and it's going to be like that for the next three or four months. That's great. Yeah, I've got... Yeah, it is great. My, my summer is pretty well booked. I'm in a weird spot right now this month. Uh, I've got so much, so many different family commitments, mostly related to my kids. Uh, I mentioned that I'm here in Durham, New Hampshire for a little bit. I've got to go actually out to your coast and pick up my son from school uh, this week. And my daughter's graduating once we're amazing. back, which is amazing. Fast. <laughs> I know, dude. <laughs> and then, and then I, and we've, then we've got like a little bit of a, a window of some family travel and then, uh, and then, you know, everybody kind of scatters for the, for the rest of the, the kids kind of scatter for the rest of the summer. But what it means is I am my, my the, the band I play in <laughs> bitter pill is doing a musical at the player's ring. And it's bizarre because the way the schedule worked out, there were there were maybe three of the ten dates, if maybe more, three of the twelve dates that I could even have like possibly potentially have done. So I'm just not doing it. They're doing it uh, sans percussion, which they did for one other one. They did Titus Andronicus uh, before I even rejoined the band. It's kind of a, it's been a weird history, right? Because I was in the mm. Bitter Pill thing the first one, and then the the second one they did as just an acoustic, and now we play obviously electric. But it's it's weird. That, uh, you know, there's this whole thing that's happening with the band that I'm I'm just not uh, involved with uh, or not participating in. I've, you know, been helped out with a little sound gear and things like that. But uh, but I, I'll, I'll be able to go see the show on, on the one of the nights that I'm actually here. But it's just kind of weird. But then the rest of the summer we've got, you know, we're stacked with gigs, which is I'm stoked for. It. That's so it's it going to be good. Yeah. Hey, great. we got a bunch of questions in. And so I want to take... A little time, if we can, Paul, and and at least begin answering some of these. Uh, they all came in to feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. So that's the place to uh, that's the place to send your thoughts, your questions, your conversation starters. Mark starts the conversation by saying, "I'm a drummer and a vocalist. Uh, a ton of similar comparisons to you, Dave." Since the pandemic, he says, I've made the decision to go with smaller bands, trios or four pieces, as well as duos, and purchased my own PA setup and do all the production side of things on my own. However, the one thing I can't seem to find find the solution for was the guy out front listening and mixing. Whenever I'm forced to mix from the drum position, I find that I spend almost all my time thinking about how it sounds out front, trying to turn effects on and off and just generally worrying about room volume, mix, and EQ. So I've been hiring local sound pros to come and mix my shows for me. It's literally a show up, hand them an iPad and mix the show, and then they get paid and leave. During the pandemic, uh, a lot of local sound pros were glad to get the extra work, but now they all have much more lucrative offers, and I can't find available people to do that job. So I'm forced to the inevitable position of running sound from the stage, and they use a Behringer XR18 and uh, an EV-powered system. He says, my question is, What's the best way to accomplish this? In my primary trio, we're all on in-ears. I play an electronic kit, and all but one of the instruments are direct in. Uh, we're a keys-based drums trio, so the keyboards have a lot of different patch levels and two main vocalists. I've done the sound check and set it and forget it way, but I find myself constantly worrying. Do you have suggestions for this type of situation, or has anyone figured out the mix from the stage dilemma? I know I can't truly replace a front of house sound engineer, but I'm hoping that I can figure out something while keeping things simple on stage and not overthinking it. So yeah, I have quite a bit of experience with this. We, we probably politically incorrectly refer to it as the Braille mix, which is not only politically incorrect, but factually incorrect, but it sends, it sends the right message. It is that set it and forget it thing, right? Where you just 
kind of hope for the best. And But there are some ways to hedge your bets towards uh, great success. We do this. We did this with uh, almost every fling gig we ever played. We do it with, mm, I would say, more than half of the bitter pill gigs we did last summer were that way. Um, the way I've always done it is I would go in and have the, you know, once we got all set up, I would have the guys play their instruments while I listened out front without being at the drums uh, and kind of balance things. The the good news and literally no one who's not a drummer wants to hear this, but it's true, is that the drums are usually the least offensive offender if they're too loud. And I know a lot of musicians will disagree with this, but in terms of sound out front, you know, you want to get the vocals up above everything. And most of the time, if something's going to compete with the vocals, it's going to be a tonal instrument. Generally, guitars, sometimes keys, rarely bass. Right, because they just sit in that same range and can just absorb all of that that sonic space. Drums that are too loud can be a problem, but generally aren't going to overpower vocals all night long unless somebody's just bashing on a crash cymbal or something. Uh, so prioritizing vocals, and you know, my formula would be go out front, get the vocals sounding good, both in terms of level and just EQing for the room, and then I would blend in the the bass, then the guitars and keys to balance. And I'd sometimes have, I'd often have somebody go and and hit my kick drum like as hard as they could so that I could get a feel for like how that was going to work and where that might need to be set in the mix. Um, and then I would test the head drum by bringing the vocals up an extra 3 dB to make sure that I had room before feedback. And then I'd bring it back down. And then that way I know on stage if I need to or even... Just as a matter of course, you know, you get three quarters of the way through the first set, everybody's going to have have had level creep. Right. And and so to know that I can just reach down and, and kind of give it that goose uh, is a is a good thing. We can uh, do one quick pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how much do you find level creep to be mitigated with this current trend of people going ampless and, and uh, you know, using in-ears and that type of thing. I, I, ha I don't have any, I don't have enough on stage experience, you know, self mixing to, um, to, to say, but my guess is it would be a lot less uh, because you're able to hear, you know, even, regardless of whether you've got a live amp on stage, if, if you're on in-ears, level creep is probably going to happen, you know, almost n never. Right. Because you, yeah. you turn it up in your own ears. You're not worried about hearing it out of your amp. So yeah, I would, I would guess that that would help quite a bit. Uh, but um, you know, and then like, for also the take go ahead, go ahead. No. All right. I'll go. I'm going to grab this real right, quick. Go. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're actually surprising me about your analysis of, of drums being the least offensive thing. I know. Um, <laughs> I'm aware of this. Because you remember, I, you know, my friend Brad Maddox had said, you know, everything is about getting a mix over drums, which are the the loudest acoustic thing that are sure. on stage usually. Sure. And um, well, I wasn't talking uh, about the loudest thing. I was talking about the thing that's going to the least offensive thing if it's too loud. Right. That's a subtlety, though. That's a that's a that's a. But it's a hugely a important one. without a difference. I think. No, 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 no. Oh. It's a distinction with a, a very important difference because I don't know. I, well, yeah, I, I, I do I'm know. I'm going to kind of push you on this because I would say, and even with the example that I'm giving you, um, as the band's energy gets up and the drummer hits harder as the energy gets up, that's what bleeds into the mics. That's what makes the mix, out, you know, front of house mix weirder. That's what makes the in ear mix weirder. So. You know, the issue of drums, you're, I, I, I feel like you're kind of abstaining responsibility for a reality that I've experienced very often. But you're not out. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about out front only, right? Like mm -hmm. it, and, and the most important thing for people to hear is vocals, right? And, and then the second most important thing for people to hear, if it's a rock band, is that kick snare, right? Because you've got to have that going. I mean, it, we'll go to any mix, anywhere live. Those are going to be in order, the loudest things. And sometimes the snare is louder than the vocals. I'm not. I'm not a fan of that. I think the vocals should be out on top of everything, but but there is a school of thought that says the snare should, you know, should sit perhaps, you know, just a touch above the vocals in the mix. Uh, if the drums are too loud, you will still hear vocals. I'm not saying that that it's impossible for drums to be too loud. 
I'm saying that it is far, the drums are the least likely instrument to compete with the vocals in the mains. And so, it, you know, but if you've got a guitar that's too loud, you'll never hear the vocals. That, that's just how it is. So that, that's where I'm, that's the difference. And I, 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 I think it, there, that is a, a difference and that's the key. I mean, you know, anytime we did sound you know, with fling or, or the same, you know, with bitter pill, it's like, as long as the vocals are out there, people think it sounds good. Uh, now, it can it be better if everybody's actually playing in balance? Of course, right? But uh, but in terms of what people out front want to hear, it's all about the vocals. So you just got to make sure you're not you don't have a- anything in the way of the vocals. And oftentimes, what that means when you're doing this, you know, mix it from the stage, set it and forget it. Uh, it often means that that you have to err on the side of having guitars too low, which is not great, but it is better than the alternative of them being too hot. Um, that, that's where we would start every fling gig. And, and, you know, I would play, I would generally play the first song with an, at least one ear, if not both ears out so that I could hear where my mix was. Cause I know that I had the vocals and the guitars balanced well. So it's like, okay, set myself in wherever it, I can fit on stage in that, in that wash. And now I know that the vocals are, are going to come through clearly and, uh, and and all of that, and just and just being mindful of where dr- volume wise I sit as the drummer in the mix, because certainly I can play too loud. I mean, that you know, I don't mean to say drums can't be too loud. They of course they can, but they're not going to compete with. They are the last thing to compete with vocals. That's that's my experience. I, you know, I get it. I hear you. Can, can they mess with your in ear mix? Sure. You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you know the. In that all things are interconnected, my comment about drums more has to do with the the inevitable cycle of life that if the drummer is pounding pretty hard, yep, and things again, me who has kind of struggled to get to a place where I can enjoy in ears, if that mix changes and I do either start futzing with my more me and my monitor or more amp of me, yep, because there is also a train of thought that well. You know, if nobody's mixing out front, um, and I now I feel that the drums are getting louder, I guess I want my guitar to cut through as well. And so then, the, and then you know, once things start getting louder, and then the vocalist has to strain, and so there's a, a a terrible cycle that happens when it's not a shared responsibility to manage stage volume. Well, but it is a shared responsibility. Like I mean, even it even, is. Even as that cycle begins, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm right. saying it is a shared responsibility. And actually, I guess what I'm really saying is that often, since it is the loudest acoustic thing on stage, drums are a big part of the dynamics of that cycle of life. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it it doesn't. Drums don't have to be the loudest acoustic thing on stage. I I played in a blues rock band for th- for six years. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> There were many nights where the uh, the Marshall stack or half stack that was on stage was absolutely the loudest thing. I, I feel you. Yeah, you know, like, but but it is a shared responsibility, but it's also a communication, right? Like before you go and turn up, if you're noticing that things have gotten loud, just tell the drummer, lay back. Mm-hmm. It, you know, hey, I, I think we're getting out of control. Can we all just take a breath? You know, bring it down. Let's keep the let's keep sound under control. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, you know. That viral video that was going around where the where the where the drummer jumps over his kit and tackles the, the singer was the singer telling him to play quieter or play or play better time. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that I've seen. You haven't this. seen that? No. Oh Lord. <laughs> All right, I got I got to find that for you right now. Yeah. You, you keep talking, and I will send it. We'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes for sure. That's great. <laughs> No, the only the only tackling on stage I've I've ever experienced was when hey. you came and tackled me. But you know, I, evidently we're not going to talk about that. So. Hey. <laughs> but right, yeah, I found that I'm going to send it to you right now. Right? Cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I that's can't great. believe you haven't seen this, Dave. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't get to see everything on the internet. I, I only get to see <laughs> some things. I've 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 curated my feed, but I am surprised that I haven't seen if it's you know generally the drummer stuff makes it to me usually. Like, you know, by fi- from 15 different people. So, uh, all right. Well, you have it now. So, all right, we'll, great. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll get it there. Let's Word to the wise don't piss off the drummer. Don't piss off. Yeah, he's the one holding sticks. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a bad idea. <laughs> but, I, you know, I don't mean to be dismissive of your, your point. It, it, you know, the, 
the 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 responsibility is shared and and that includes you know reminders to one another on stage like hey you're too loud bring it down and that should be an okay thing for anyone to say to anyone on stage at any time mm. right yep. i i really believe that and it it should be heard you know and and if hopefully not discussed much on stage but if there is a recurring thing you know either somebody's playing too loud or somebody's sensitive about someone and maybe they are or aren't playing too loud. But that, that constant discussion of the mix, mix I think is, is really important and can be super helpful. You, you know, I, I say that we would set it and forget it with, with fling and with bitter pill. Well, that's partially true. The other part is if, you know, there's one song where somebody's in the band isn't playing, if it's a song with just one guitar or whatever, they go out front and they come back and report like, oh, you know, sounds good. Or eh, I think we could like tweak this or whatever. Mm. Or you have, you know, a person placed strategically in the crowd that is a trusted ear and have them let you know, because that can work really well, too. Uh, you know, if you're if you're in that position where you got to mix yourself. Trusted but, ear. The trusted ear. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, start. Start with the vocals, bring everything up, and then and then, like I said, my my trick was always to see if I could get an extra three dB out of the vocals without it feeding back in the room. Mm. And if I could do that, like I said, I'd bring it down, and then I just know later in the gig, like if I feel like things are just getting, you know, increasing, just give it a little goose, and it's fine. So you figure it out, you learn what your band needs. Hopefully, he, you know, he did. Mark did mention. Worrying about turning effects on and off and all of that. No, 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 no. Like, don't drive yourself crazy. I, I would say don't use it. My philosophy, I'm not a huge fan of reverb on vocals. Some people are. Uh, I am not. I, I think it, it clutters things up, especially in clubs. Outside, sure. But in clubs, it, it can really fight you, especially if you're not out there to manage it. So I'm a big fan of maybe a touch of reverb and then some slapback, both in in the in the mains, but also in the monitors. Uh, the nice part about a little bit of slapback, just one slap and a quick delay, is that if you're using monitor wedges, you can keep them lower with slapback there because you actually get to hear yourself just after you've sung. So you're not competing with what's coming out of the monitor. And it you really can hear a whole lot more clearly that way. Um, and if the slap's quick enough, you know, you can get your pitch and all of that stuff from it without it being mm -hmm. distracting. So a little bit of, a little bit of slap in both places thickens up the vocals and kind of gives people what they need to hear both on and, you know, on stage and in front of house. So sure. I don't know. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of comments about this. I'm sure because, because everybody yeah, wants because, to I mean, the reality of most bands is that they are mixing themselves. Right? Correct. I, mean, I, I would think so. I, yeah. Not everybody has a bill. Not everybody has a bill. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm curious to hear what what uh, what people say. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. While we're on the subject of things that are certain to uh, incite conversation and loud drummers, listener Henry wrote in and he said, I'm on a cruise ship and they have a killer band playing. One thing I noticed is that they have a good size plexiglass shield in front of the drummer. I'm wondering if this would be good for smaller establishments where keeping volumes down is an issue. I'm thinking about possibly considering it for my band here. He says, seeing I'm not a drummer, I'm wondering what your thoughts would be on something like this. Before I share my thoughts, Paul, do you have any like off the cuff thoughts about drum shields? Have you played with them? Have you thought about them? I've never played with them. I see a lot of people are, but um, I have never, I've never had a drummer play behind one. Yep. I don't know how effective they are. I mean, a, the, the the one that I know most, I think uh, Bonamassa's drummer plays behind a shield. Hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I've seen them before, but have you played behind one? I've, I, oh yeah, many times. It it can, they can work very well. Um, it, there, there's a couple things that you, that I've learned with them. Uh, the, the, the first thing is that they work in two directions, right? So, not only does it prevent the the drums, especially the high end of the drums, from projecting just to the other side of the shield, uh, it also prevents any sort of sound that lives in that sibilance range, aka you know conversation, from penetrating the shield in the other direction. So you need to think about that. The height of the drum shield can be 
a deciding factor here. My experience is if you have the ability, cut the drum shield to just above where the cymbals hit so that it's blocking the cymbals from going straight out, but not just yeah. like cocooning the, the person off from, from conversation on stage. That would be the So let me ask thing. you a question. Yeah. Let's just pause here and, and sure. think about this for a second. So no amps. Jumpers, but are we putting socks on all the rock and roll we're trying to play here? I mean, are we <laughs> literally, are we overthinking the just basic skill set of people playing together, playing, you know, with a reasonable volume and, uh, you know, getting a, getting a gig done? I mean, is it impossible for a drummer to play a small room and play rock and roll and not be the loudest thing in the world? I mean, you know. No, what, no, it's what, not it, impossible. It, not at all. Right. I say that as so, a drummer so, who's had to do it and, and succeeded at times and failed at others. But, uh, you know, yeah. it is possible. Yeah, for sure. So, so again, we can talk about how to use a shield. Yeah. But should you use a shield? Well, I mean, I, you know, I went and saw and I have some thoughts about the venue where I saw we'll talk about it later in the show. But I went and saw the Trey Anastasio band in Boston uh, at a new venue called Roadrunner this weekend. And I was it was the first time I noticed that there was a a I'll call it a, a three quarter shield around the drums. It was, you know, around well, two thirds shield. It was around two sides of the drums and, and not the side facing the bass player. But um, but it was, you know, there was a shield down the front and then down the, the left side of the kit. And it was the first time I've noticed Russ Lawton doing that. I, it's possible he's always had one, but. Um, but it's not, it was, a, it was the first time I saw it, but it's not uncommon to set up a shield, even, uh, you know, for big touring bands that are playing on, on large stages to set up a shield strategically between say, you know, the drum kit and the cymbals specifically, and a musician that has to stand right in front of them or right next to that all night long with their ears, especially if the drums are up on a riser or something like that, you know, just so that it keeps especially again if these musicians are not using in ears it it allows them to really kind of keep stage volume under control and and if you're doing it night after night even if you're not you know being aware of of that can be a good thing um but in terms of you know cocooning the whole the whole thing off I, i've i've experienced that most frequently in the theater world and that can be okay because you generally have one person that is the music director kind of truly just being the conductor all the way through. And you generally don't need conversation in two directions. You just need to hear that person and they're going to be, you know, on a headset mic in your ears. And that's just going to be fine. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, shielded off from from them and, and the world or not. Um, I have done it for some rock gigs and it can work. It depends on the club. Like some rooms, you know, if they if they're super bouncy and you know lots of brick or or hardwood or glass, you know, drum cymbals and snare drums can be really overpowering, even even in it with the best control, right? And so, but the the issue with it, you know, for a a like a gigging band is that setting these things up can be time consuming and cumbersome carrying them around can be super cumbersome and getting them just into place right and and you know all of that stuff can add quite a bit of time you can mitigate that by you know not using a stand for them and maybe attaching these shields to your rack or or, or you know cymbal stands or something so that it's right where it needs to be, but, but not a huge ordeal to move these huge pieces in and out. Uh, but it, 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 anytime I've, I've used them, it's always when we've had more time than we possibly could need to set up. But if you're trying to show up and, and play in an hour, a shield is probably going to make that impossible. At least I, I haven't found the way to, you know, to, to fit it into the normal, kind of gigging routine. Um, so, but it, you, you know, you're going to need to mic everything now, right? You, you know, you, you're not going to rely on the drums in the room as much. You might get some weird bounce off the ceiling or something, but now you've got to close mic the drums uh, to, to make that work. And the drummers almost certainly got to be on ears because they're going to need to be able to hear all the things that they are now shielded from, right? All the guitars and the vocals and everything. There's nothing coming coming through the shield to either direction. And it does make the drums sound different because you're hearing 
the you know the symbols reflecting off of them. But it but it can work. Like it can it can be the difference maker in a given venue for being able to play with acoustic drums or not. And so like, I, but to your point, are we overthinking it? I, I don't know. It, 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 it depends on, it depends on the scenario, I guess. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not entirely for them. I'm not entirely against them. It, they, they have a purpose. I get it. I, I don't know. Yeah. Wait, it. like, would you ever, Consider putting, you know, some amount of shielding in front of or between you and the drum kit on. I mean, I've done stuff like that before. Oh, between me and a drum kit. I thought on stage in front of my amp. Yeah. Um, nope. Nope. I got to say, <laughs> you know, I play little tiny stages where we're packed in like sardines. I yep. play really big stages. Yep. And, um, you know, again, with in-ears now, I'm, I'm really, I'm really pretty happy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But even before, you know. Um, I don't know. You kind of, like most of us, you, you know, your brain has some way of, of deciphering the messages that it's hearing, you know, that you get a feel for your band and, yeah. you know, what you need to hear and, you know, what the room feels like and all those types of things. So I don't know. The grip it and rip it technique, you know, there's a lot to be said for that in terms of, in terms of band vibe, you know, what yeah. you can put out there in a given show. But, you know, Technology moves on and gives us better solutions, makes things cheaper, faster, lighter, better, you know. And yeah. I guess that's just life is that things go better. But I don't know. I, some things you do have to think about whether something's uh, clever to have or really truly useful. Yep. In the big scope, you know, whatever problem you're trying to solve. It's, I, it's a tool like anything else. It is. Yeah. And I, I will say, you know, the first time that I I, certainly the first time I remember playing with a drum shield was at Foxwoods. We had played there many times. And then after the first set of one of our runs there, and like I said, it was probably our third or fourth time there. Sound guy came up and he's like, now nah, I want to put a shield over the drums. He's like, and it was a terrible, like the way the stage was built was just awful. It was built to re like reflect sound up and out. It was it was tough, right? So it was always something that you kind of had to manage, and and it was fine. I you know I had a good relationship with the sound engineer, and and he came up and he's like, it's just going to be simpler if we put a uh, a shield up around the drums, and the entire band was just against this, and I was like, okay, we're, we'll get there. It's like oh, it's like we're being punished. It's like no, it's just the function of the room. Like it's fine, but. You know, you're trying to, the, the, the attempt by the sound engineer was to like set this up and get it rolling in a 20 minute set break. And it was like, dude, like we're going to need to rethink everything. Like that's not going to, like I, I'm with you. I'm here to help. I'm not here to be, you know, to, to convince you to stop this, but we're probably going to need an hour now to like re-mic the drums, retweak our our monitor mixes because now the band's not going to hear what they need to hear and so like sound check starts over now you know and and it it took him a little while to sure. to to wrap his head around that it was like if you wanted to do this you know 4 hours ago when we arrived would have been the best time right now now is is the second best time but it's a distant second you know or and but we got through it I think we probably took us 45 minutes instead of 20 minutes to to get there. And, and then we tweaked throughout the, the night and when we got there and then I think we played a three night run or something. But yeah, I remember the, and, but by the end of it, we really did re like find a way to connect as a band that, and that was the, the thing that I think everybody was, was most resistant for was that reason of like, wait, you know, we, we just played a set of music. We figured like we're, we're locked in now. Now you're separating us from one another, you know, and, and so like, how are we going to do this? And I was like, we, we figure it out, you, you know, you get there, but, but it requires, it requires a lot of work. You got to, you almost always have to have a, a microphone for the band to use, to talk back to the drummer, unless, unless you have the shield at the right height where you can talk over mm -hmm. it or whatever, but most shields that you like the, the shields that you just get out of the box or whatever are generally far too tall for uh, for their intended purpose, and and they can wind up causing more trouble uh, than helping. But you can get there; you can make it work. I don't know. Yep. You had some stuff with requests going on, my friend. 
Well, I did. I had a good weekend last weekend. I played, um, I played three days in a row. And the first thing about that experience is I'm really thinking, because I have a lot of work coming up over the next four months. Yeah. And I'm thinking a lot about my voice and about how to, how to you know, keep it ready for the next one. And so first thing I want to say is um, I am keenly aware. I am very diligent about a good 20-minute warm-up okay. on, the dry, on the drive to a gig. Um, and so if I, if I carpool with someone, it'll throw off my, my routine. So I got to, you know, figure that out, but totally. right now I'm driving myself to a gig, right? <laughs> yes. No, yeah, the carpool, do scales. <laughs> the carpool vocal warm up is a weird thing to have to, to manage. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, you know, remember Broadway stars and, and, and many singers sing, you know, you do a show in Vegas, you're singing five, six, seven shows a week, right? Yeah. It is not impossible to do it if you have good techniques. So good technique is really important. Warm up is really important. They say warm down is important. I'm not much of a warmer downer, but I do drink a lot of water and I've kind of really laid off alcohol. Someone will buy me a glass of wine at a winery gig or, you know, I might have a beer, you know, at a, and I probably shouldn't if I'm really going to be strict about this. Sure. Because I like come, this week coming up, like I said, I have six gigs in five days. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of singing to do. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot of singing. But, and I assume you're the primary vocalist on every one of those six gigs. Is that right? I'm the sh- it, well, uh, in in five of the six gigs, I'm the only vocalist, and then and then in the House Rockers gig, I'm you're you know, shared. Yeah, about forty yeah. percent. Yeah. So, um, just keeping an eye towards this. You know, I've got a job to do, and I've got to do it again tomorrow. And you know, what does that mean? Um, and being really diligent about about good vocal practices is something I'm really really focused on. Now the flip side of this is there is that thing where when you're warmed up and you're singing a lot that your voice gets this really nice creamy, you know, thick texture. Yeah. That it, it, to me is really fun to sing with and um and adds a character, you know, of kind of, you know, worn in leather shoes that is uh, that is really awesome. So there's that sweet spot between the two. Like, you know, you want to still sing, so, you know, your voice does what it does. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be conserving stuff because you also want to give your... your yeah, you want to give a performance. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, there technique, I guess what I'm saying is, a good vocal technique is key, and um, I'm really focused on it. I will be sharing a lot of stories about that. I have I have a couple of I think I have uh, an eight and ten day stretch coming up the first of July, so mm. that that will be quite a bit. So, but uh, I am focused on that. But yes, the thing I did want to share with you is about requests. I had a winery gig on Saturday. Uh, the trio that I have down in Central California, Central Coast of California, we have a standing winery gig. It's really fun, nice outdoor patio, beautiful, and um, in general, it's a you know it's, it's a big tasting patio, and people are listening and appreciative. But it's definitely not a dance a dance thing. Sure, um, okay, I got. But you. occasionally, someone will say, "Hey, it's my you know friend's birthday," or "Do you know this?" or whatever. And I was thinking about how that whole again the the circle of life, right? How many people know when they come up and request something that that is a tippable action? Right? <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is a very interesting thing. And I've actually seen musicians just kind of like motion to the tip jar when people come up and ask for something. Yeah. I would say 70%, maybe 80% of people combine a request with a tip. Interesting. Sound about right to you? Um, it depends on the gig. It depends on the vibe of it. But I, I mean, if you've... If you work to set that tone, then yes. You know, when I was in Nashville last year, I saw a lot of people that, you know, somebody would come up with a request or something and they'd point not, not just to their tip jar, but to their Venmo and say, you know, tip me with, put your request in Venmo with your tip Mm. and I will, that way I have it on the list here and I don't need to write it down because I'm in the middle of doing this thing, by the way, you know. It, I would think those Nashville musicians have elevated the whole yeah. tipping <laughs> tipping rap to a to a to a science, right? You know, they beyond have to. art. Yeah, they that's what I'm saying. I, I would imagine that they're like, you know, literally this is the way I get my money. And so, you know, which is cool. And and yeah. actually there's probably a lot of good lessons to learn. If you are a musician in Nashville and you want to give us any of your oh. tipping tips, I would love to hear that. Yeah, please. Anyway, Feedback yeah. at giggabpodcast.com. Absolutely. So the point of this is a a woman walked up to me about 80% of the way through the gig 
Uh, she had that look. She clearly had an agenda. She was. She had a pretty deep accent, so I think she might have been at this winery on vacation. But she came up, and she asked for a song uh, that I couldn't do. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that in a second as well. Okay. Don't let me off the hook on that. And then, okay. and then she asked for a couple other songs. I said, I'm sorry. No, I don't, I don't happen to know, though. And she kind of looked at me surprised. And then she kind of went down the list, and she asked for a couple more. And then she asked for one that I didn't know that song, but... I knew another song by, the, by that band, and that's usually enough to you know make a, a, a midway thing. But she actually was insistent on the one song. Yeah. And when I said I didn't know that one, she took her phone out and started flipping through looking for other songs. And all of a sudden, it, got, it was clear she wasn't going to take no for an answer. And um, uh, I really wanted to try and find something to you know connect with her. But n- now there was a bad vibe. Like she was, she was. Yeah, you you, this, but, you had somehow offended her by not coming to the gig, guessing as to what song it was she was going to request for you to do. That's right. Right. So the first song that she walked up was Besame Mucho. Oh, man. Well, that and it's kind of funny that you say that because, um, you know, after we kind of went through this conversation and I said, you know, I don't know that, but I do this. And she goes, no, no, no how about this? And, you know, and then I finally played one that was kind of close. And I said, oh, hopefully that did it for you, you know. And I said, so sorry about Basin Mimuchu. And she looked at me deadpan and she goes, it's a standard. <laughs> was, oh, no. <laughs> Maybe for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you come from, but not here. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. But it is kind of an interesting thing because we talk about the rock and roll uh, fake book. You know, sure. The, but um, I wonder, you know, for many people out there, <laughs> it actually it caused me to pause because – yeah, I guess in 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 one realm of life it is a standard, you know. Uh, and the question is, how many standards? I guess it depends on what type of band you're in or what type of musician you are. I mean, Autumn Leaves is a standard, but if I went and asked the House Rockers to play it, that that would be weird. I'm not saying that that half the band doesn't already know it, but that's a weird song at that gig, right? Like it's it there's standards, but but the, there's many different standards books. The the one that that applies to the gig that you're at is the is the one that matters, right? So, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway, she wanted, um, she wanted uh, a song by The Cure, and I offered just like heaven, but she wanted either Friday I'm in Love or uh, Love Song. Oh, What's it called? Love Song. That was yeah, the other big hit. It is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, and uh. And I couldn't, I, I didn't have those ready, but I had just like heaven. Yeah, just like you heaven. You me. check the box. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, oh, but it only seemed to make her even a little more frustrated. And I guess that's my question is like, have you ever experienced this? The person who comes to you with a request with a purpose. Yeah. And if their request is not met, and some of this might have been cultural. Like I said, she had a really heavy accent. And so I don't know. But have you ever encountered this? Or All like the time. Kind of like. Yeah, 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 of course. And it, gently talk someone off the ledge. You got to talk them off the ledge. Your, you know, your approach of I, I don't know that song, but I know this other song by that artist. Like that, that to me, that checks the box, right? Like that's the a great way to approach it. Uh, one thing we always joke about at Monkey Fist gigs is is we we say you know we may not know a song by your favorite artist, but we almost certainly know a song that your favorite artist has heard before and we promise <laughs> to play that right so but you know you, i mean that that we usually do that little shtick early on in the night so that it sets the tone of like we're going to take some liberties here because we know what we know and if you ask us to go outside the realm we may choose to but be careful what you wish for you know yeah. and 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 so that's that's but yeah, there are those people, like you said, that I like the way you said it, that they come with a purpose and there's no pleasing them. And, yeah. uh, you know, and we've, I've been in those scenarios where it's like, we don't know that song, but okay, we're going to try it. And then they're upset that you butchered it. It's like, well, like we, we, we've explained this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually the line that I usually use is, you know, when I'm telling people, Hey, if you have something you want to hear, 
Come let me know. If I know it, I'll play it. The best requests are songs that I know. But my real one purpose in life is not to butcher your favorite song and That's not make it. it no longer your favorite song. Yeah, yeah do no harm is uh, <laughs> is a phrase that that Aaron Abbott in Fling often said. And you know, we would bring songs in. Like he, I remember when we brought uh, Tempted in that that squeeze tune, which is a song that that he likes a lot. He's like, okay, he's a lot like of chords. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is a lot of chords. Yeah, and. Yeah. And he's like, okay, he's like, but, but that song is, is a well-crafted song. Mm. It really is. Right. And yeah. so Aaron's like, we got to make sure we hold true to our do no harm, you know, mantra here. He's like, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do this song the way it, th- without doing it harm. And I was like, oh, that's fair. Like that, that is a good, a good litmus test. Uh, but, but that yeah. litmus test goes out the window when you're trying to just pull something off the cuff. One Final, I think final thought about this to manage the person with the unrealistic expectations is to say, hey, you know, I don't know that or we don't know that. I'm going to take a look at it on my break and see mm-hmm. if we can fit it into the set. It at least diffuses the the scenario in the moment and gets them the hell away from the stage, <laughs> you know, uh, which often is all it takes. And then, you know, you get to the set break and it's like, are we going to look at that song? It's like, no, well, we, we're, we're no, but we'll, we can tell them that we did and it's just not going to work out. It's too, it's yeah. too difficult to pull off the cuff, but you know, th- that, that I will take a look at it later. Uh, but for now I'm doing a thing. I don't, not sure if you yeah. noticed like, you know, that, yep, yep. that, that can help sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I've used that. Let me look it up during our break and see yeah. what I can do. And yeah, sometimes it, I do it done. Although I will tell you, Dave, what well, worth the price of admission was turning around and asking the guys in my band if they knew Basin Mimucha. The looks on their faces <laughs> were freaking hysterical. Well, that's it. Is that can become one of those moments where you're like you, bonding? You, it will, yeah, and you'll like this will come up at you know all future gigs, right? It's like, well, I don't know what to play next. I I guess it's Basin Mimucha, guys, right? Is that we're good to go, you know, and yeah, it becomes a thing, yeah. Yeah, but that's fun, right? You know, that's like you said that that that's what makes it the, your band a band. It is those kinds of things, the shared crisis, yep, those shared little crisis moments. for sure. Yeah. Speaking of crisis, I mentioned this new venue, Roadrunner, that opened in Boston. I think it's been open about six weeks or something like that. And it's a, I I love what this venue is in theory and could be. It's a it's a thirty they they call it a thirty five hundred person venue. It's all GA. Uh, it's 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 a cement floor club with a balcony and good sight lines from pretty much everywhere, and a stage that is wide enough and tall enough to be like an arena size stage. So you can bring mm-hmm. acts in and and sort of do bigger shows to a smaller crowd, right? Which is great. I I love that, that clubs like this uh, exist and I'm happy to have one, you know, within an hour of the the house here. It's a, um, it was an interesting, I went and saw the Trey Anastasio band. So Trey's the the guitar player and fish. The the crowd is usually pretty um, happy, but, but trouble free in in the sense of like violence free is what I'll, what I'll say. You You know, certainly any crowd can have trouble, but it it was an interesting thing. The the venue staff. I don't even just want to say the security there, but certainly security was a huge part of of the issue. The venue staff was not welcoming, and and we noticed that like as soon as we walked in, they were like I don't even want to say like stressed. They were just amped up, looking for trouble, and it was just like okay, like fine, you know, we'll we'll get in. It's all good. Like there was no. Like a lot of venues, even, you know, you go to the Boston Garden, the, the people are like happy to see you. They're they're happy to to take your ticket and, you know, show you to your seat and they're accommodating, right? Like they're also there to make sure you don't do anything stupid and, and you know, uh, take you out of the, the venue if you're if you're doing stupid things, but they're not looking for trouble. And uh, this place was, it was bizarre mm. how amped up security was. E- even like before the show started, they came through with their flashlights and like, nobody can sit on the floor. You got to get up. You got to get up. And it's like, okay, like r- relax. If you'd like us to get up, we'll get up. 
like this seems weird. Like again, Boston Garden, Madison Square Garden, everywhere else you go, if there's a cement floor, show hasn't started yet. You sit down on the floor. Like that's totally fine. I mean, it's a cement floor. It's not the most comfortable thing to sit on, but it's what you, <laughs> you know. But it's what you do. And it's like if you want us to get up. You know, turn the house lights down and put the band on stage. Watch us pop right up. It's all going to be fine. You (laughs) You know, Uh, but they just came through lights in our faces, uh, you know, and it was like, whoa, okay, fine. Like, we'll we'll get an odd flex, but sure, no problem. You know, we're not here to cause trouble. We were just doing our thing. Like, and that was the, the problem is every scenario I ran into was them enforcing some rule that was not previously communicated. And, Does and, the venue have a reputation for having trouble? Do they do they book bands to kind of bring in a, a different? It's been know, open six crowd, weeks. Or? I don't know. No. It, yeah, I don't. But it felt like yeah, that's what it felt like. Was like they didn't understand that. No, like you, like it all night. They were adding fuel and sparks to a fire that was not yet lit. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> and and there were I, I I and I guess that there's strict no smoking indoors rules. If someone so much as lit a lighter, there would be four lights immediately, like spotlighting them from the balconies. And then the security on the floor would, would you know, converge on them and just immediately remove them. And I was like, okay, like, again, you're not really communicating that people can't smoke in here. Maybe it should be known, but like put signs up. That's okay. Like make it real clear that we have a zero tolerance policy on this so that people aren't just shocked when, you know, somebody shows up to escort them out of the venue. And, and it, there was one moment at the end of the, the night, the first show I was in the bathroom line. There were these two guys in front of me who let's just say the bar had, had well served them, right? They were well served by the bar and they were, they were a little drunk, but they were super just happy and joking around and, and harmless. Like they were totally, I was not worried about them at all. It was totally fine. And they turned to a security guard who was standing there kind of watching just by the bathroom line. I don't, I don't even know what he was doing. And they pointed to a trash can and, and asked him like, how bad would it be if we peed in there? You know, and I mean, clearly they're not going to do this, right? Because they asked the guy, you know, and, and they're having this conversation. The guy's response was to immediately start screaming at them, swearing at them. I freaking hate you. Y- you know, I would, I would beat the crap out of you. Like this whole thing. And it was just like, whoa, whoa, where did this come from? What's happening here? Like this, this was not a violent in- exchange. This was two drunk guys asking a stupid question. Like, it's going to be fine. They're not going to pee in the trash can. And even if they did, that's also not the right reaction, sir. You know, like chill out just a little bit. So I, w- I would say my reaction to that as a, as a, as a guy who's trying to bring fans to a show. Yeah. It is my fans don't like coming to a certain place because they don't feel safe or they don't, you know, they, you know, don't feel comfortable. Yeah. They're not going to come. It's not a good, it's right. not a good relationship. Right. That said, I have not really encountered this. I mean, we play, you know, pretty upscale suburban clubs sure. and festivals and stuff like that. I will say that uh, the club that we've played the most at had a change in ownership and a change in vibe. So whereas before they used to have, Big football player size guys yeah. who were in sta- in security shirts and made themselves present, but they were kind of cuddly, nice guys. Now, uh-huh. whether they, every once in a while they had to take care of business, I don't sure. know. I sure. never actually saw that, but they were they were there. They, they were, were a the presence in the room. Yeah, they were a presence. And then I've you know new ownership has got more. Um, I don't want to diss the guys because they're taking their jobs seriously. I mean, they they just are a different style. They're yeah. they're not six foot six guys, but they're you know letting people know that they're looking around for trouble. They're they're more of the anticipating trouble as opposed yes. to the we we rarely ever have trouble here. But if we do, we can handle it. Well, right? that's so, it. It's right. It's the it, it's the the vibe of anticipating trouble, or we're here to help in case there is trouble. Right, like, and there's a whole bunch of gray in between of course. trouble and no trouble, right? Of, and that's actually probably where they make their living. They're probably doing a lot more yes. with the guy who's drunk and fallen down that needs to be sat down outstairs, yeah. you know, downstairs, than they are in actually, you know, breaking up fights or that type of thing. I mean, uh, yeah, but I would, I, 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 that's why I asked the question. I mean, were these guys? Does the owner of the venue gotten any feedback that hey, the security's a little intense here, or you know, or is he like? Yes, that's I know that's what I want. 
Um, you know, I don't want a lawsuit when something bad happens. I mean, there's, there's yeah, a whole yeah, although understanding. That, that kind of vibe can cause that lawsuit. Without you know, a doubt. W- the event. Without a doubt. Right. Like that's, you know, the way I look at it, because we used to, you've run far more events than I have. But when we were running Cirque du Mac, uh, that was a big party and people, we had, we ran an open bar and there were generally more people in the venue than fire code probably allowed. Right. And, and I remember many times at those events over the years before we played kind of looking at the crowd and saying, okay, you know, like everybody's happy here. If we give them a, a focal point for that happiness to amplify it, things are generally going to be okay. There might be somebody that gets, you know, gets too drunk and needs to be like you said, sat down or escorted out or helped or whatever, but generally speaking, there's not going to be fights. There's not going to, you know, the, no one's adding that element into the room. So it's just not going to be there. But, you know, we would do an event. There were, what, maybe a thousand people at those, you know, somewhere between 800 and a thousand people at any given Cirque du Mac event. And there were two security guards, right? So if the security guards start causing trouble and picking fights at some point, if the sentiment of the crowd changes against them, like they're outnumbered pretty yeah. quickly. You know, yeah. and and that would be true anywhere. So, I I would think, and I I I've oh, I have limited experience w- from that side of it, but I would think that the mentality going in is your job m- first and foremost is to constantly be reading the room, and and app- and responding appropriately to make sure you sort of maintain the level of bliss that's possible in the room. Because if the room turns against you, it's over. That's it. Right. <laughs> there's no, like, there's not enough security. It doesn't matter how many you have. So, but yeah, these guys were just like super juiced. It was like they, it was like they were on, you know, the verge of a roid rage at any given yeah, point yeah. in time. And everybody was talking about it. You, you know, the, the online after the first night, it was just comment after comment after comment. Like, what was the deal? Like, nobody was sure. causing trouble. And then, of course, you know, the second night, uh, as we were waiting for the band to start, it was the same kind of thing. <laughs> so everybody's like, yeah, yeah you got to kind of like, well, you don't even know. And there was one guy that was standing near us that they, they targeted him and started escorting him from the venue. And he just said very calmly, he says, I, I think you have the wrong guy. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know what I did. And they're like, no, it's you. And he's like, I don't, like, I don't think so, but let me know what happened. You, you know? And, uh, and they're like, it's you. And then, and then one of the other guards is like, wait, no, I think it's this guy over here. And it, like, they, you know, descended Gosh. on that guy. And then the guy that was with me is like, or the, not with me, but the guy that was near us that was saying, you got the wrong guy started like asking him like, so I don't have to go. Like, I don't want to cause trouble, but I also don't want to leave because I'm enjoying yeah. the show. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it and it's just a hop, skip and a jump from, from, secu- you know, when we're talking about bar staff or venue yeah. staff or event staff, yeah. it's just a hop, skip and a jump from the security to the wait staff and the bar staff. Are they friendly? Are they, you know, accommodating? Exactly. And again, a lot of times. Yeah, I'm talking about an extreme here, but, but it, it matters if you've got, if you're playing at a place and they're just happy, that makes it so much better for everyone. Yeah. 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 And you know, it's that conversation that we have a running thread on is, you know, do venue owners want the bands input on stuff or are we, you, you know, just there play your set and, you know, collect whatever you've agreed to and, and away you go. But when you get to a point where you actually have a following yeah, and that following is worth money to people, I think it's, you know, a smart thing for bands to kind of assert their, yeah. you know, you wouldn't want to bring your friends and family to a place you wouldn't want to bring your friends and family, right? Or much it. less your fans. So, I mean, I think it makes a sense. And so seeking out those venues that are, you know, safe and, and fan friendly, because you can be both. Yep. That's, that's that's a noble quest. That's the key. Yeah, when we were doing those fling fests all the time at the Stone Church, we really worked with them. And they were friendly people like that. This part of it wasn't an issue. But the sound in there, it's not a great sounding room. It, it's a difficult room to do sound in. Maybe that's a better way to phrase that. Yeah. And and it's not uncommon for an engineer to have, you know, figured out sort of their generic approach to the room, which often one school of thought in there is to kind of blow through the room and and be louder than than not so that everybody's hearing it from the mains even if that's not necessarily you know the the, the quietest or the most um 
uh, economical thing to do with the decibel levels. And then, you know, there's other ways of, of approaching that. And we learned very quickly, like our the, the crowds that we were bringing, it was a, a family ish event, you know, teens and families and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, we learned pretty quickly that people didn't want to have their hair blown back out of the room. And so we we would talk to the, the house engineer and be like, hey, uh, you know, I, I know that when you have a huge rock show in here, your temptation is to or the school of thought is to push it up. And it is going to be full tonight. This is a sold out event. However, you know, what we found has worked in the past is maybe, you know, kick drum and vocals in, in the mains and, you know, maybe bleed in guitars during solos and, and let's manage it that way. That tends to work better for our crowd. And again, as long as you have the conversation in a productive way, every engineer we worked with was like, oh, that, okay, great to know. Thank you. Y you know, whereas... But but that it, those kinds of conversations are okay to have, be it sound or uh, attitude of, of towards the uh, patrons and all of that stuff. Like you said, if you're and that's an interesting thing to add to our list of what makes a professional. I mean, it, it is interesting the ones who are willing to insist on quality sound, yeah. quality service, quality you know a clean room and all those types of things yeah. versus just happy to just happy to have the gig. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an, these are all okay. You know, we talk about how everything's a negotiation and it's okay to negotiate. You, you don't, it doesn't have to be a, a, a zero sum game, right? That the, the end result of these conversations is a, a better experience for everyone, the venue, yeah. the patrons, and of course you is the, the entertainment. Uh, but it, you, you've, you've got to be willing to have these conversations. And again, you learn to do it tactfully and sometimes even as tactful as you think you are, you catch somebody on a bad day and it goes sideways and you learn to deal with that too because it's just life yeah. and it's humans. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, like I said, those security people, are they over zealous and trying to justify their existence? You know, their, yeah. their job. I mean, right. I'm trying to prove to everybody that, you know, I'm, I'm the real deal. Same thing goes, you know, like my, my pet peeve is more with bar staff. A lot of, we've played places where the bar is under service, not enough bartenders yeah. for the number of people we told them we would bring. Yep. I get it if they didn't believe us the first time that we would actually bring that number of people. But the second time, now that's your choice to not have enough people. And then the bartenders get cranky and they don't make eye contact and they don't, you know, people don't get service in a prompt way. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of things. It, you are in the customer service business. The security people are too. I mean, the wait staff is, the bar staff is, the venue host is. I mean, everybody. You are, you are creating, trying to create an environment that people like to come. Not people have to come because they always have a choice. Right. Oh, I mean, I I am uh, at least with our small business show audience, famous for saying that every business is the customer service business. I, like. I don't know of any business that's not in the customer service business. Like you are serving your customers or you don't have a business. And, mm. and yet there are so many businesses that don't think that way. And, and, yeah. and they're obvious when you encounter them, of course, you know, I, the, the other thing I say is make it easy to take people's money. Like that should not be a point of friction. I don't understand. And, and we can take that lesson too. Like the tip jar, make sure, you know, I, I've seen people, Nowadays, I don't carry cash on me, especially not small bills. I might, you know, like tuck a $20 bill in, in like my phone wallet or something just so I have some amount of cash on me. But, but small bills for, for tipping, it, you know, if I happen to be at a, a, a place where there's a band playing or something, a lot of people don't carry cash anymore. The, the pandemic changed that. But it's easy to put up a Venmo sign or a PayPal sign or something and make it easy for people to tip you. And honestly, I probably tip more when I am using uh, Venmo than if I'm having to manage whatever limited bills I have in my wallet on that given day. So, but make it easy. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad to get all that off our chests, Paul. It's good stuff. You got anything else for today? No, no. We went, we went to a couple interesting places. I think so. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks so much for sending in your questions and feedback and thoughts. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love, love, love to hear from you. That's the fuel that keeps us going. So it's a wonderful thing being able to do this. It is. It is. What's the... Uh, always be performing. That's always it. Always be performing. Always, always, always be performing. Always be performing. 
See you next week, I think. <laughs> <laughs>